Uh, Gary Breen is with us this morning to talk to us about this. Gary, how are you doing? I'm very well. Good morning, guys. Yeah, so it's been a bit quiet around here for the last 24 hours. No, no big stories brewing, not making international news at all. Maybe we'll, we'll park that for now and uh, talk about some football. Um, okay. We had a Swiss journalist in with us yesterday who was basically saying Switzerland feel like they need to win this game because they drew their home game, yeah. um, having been 3-0 up against Denmark. I, like, I think you're actually going to be okay if you draw your away games, but you do have to start winning games to get out of a group as difficult as this one. So... Does it feel like we have to win this game ourselves? No, I don't think we have to win it. No, I don't. I think Mick McCarthy has said that although he'll be going to win it, and I've no doubt in my mind about that, having worked with him, he'll expect his team to win in Dublin. He always has done. But I think he's quite pragmatic in terms of saying if he got a draw, he'd take it. And I think that just keeps us in a really good position. I think Mick's always put the emphasis on the fact that we, we, we've done brilliantly for the first part of this campaign. He said the 10 points in the four games is great, but it's nothing more than he expected. And he'll have said to those guys as they went off on their summer holidays, listen, great job, great character in terms of coming back from where they'd been at such a low ebb before he came in. But he would have said to him, and no doubt in my mind, he would have said, listen, the hard work's still to come and it starts tonight. Yeah, so uh, in terms of the quality of performances that we've seen from the team so far, what, what level do you yeah. think they're going to be at? Because like, they, they need to step it up. And in fairness, they stepped it oh, up from course. The, Gibraltar to Georgia and they need a massive step up now as well. Yeah, listen, there's no, Mick's not put any spin on it, has he? When we've played reasonably well, he said there's good parts. When we haven't played particularly well, he said it was a horrible game at times, he said. So, listen, he'll be honest enough in that and he'll know that they have to step up. But he'll be giving them that belief. He'll said that... They'll have done the work. He's been quite vocal in terms of how much work his analysts have done in terms of trying to find weaknesses within this Swiss team because they're a dogmatic team. They're, they're good. They're consistent. In fact, they qualify for seven of the last eight major tournaments. Shows you that. And in terms of the rare players, that you know, they've got players who are playing Champions League, Europa League. So they have got good players. There's no doubt. But he'll have a belief and a system that he thinks he can put in place that can hurt this Swiss team. And, and coupled with the fact that He'll have the crowd behind him. He said this going into the game, that the mood's changed. He feels it, that the, the supporters are back with the team again. And that's great because as an Irish team, we're not ever going to achieve anything without the Irish supporters behind us. When you hear the name Switzerland, certainly as Irish football fans, it kind of sends shivers on our spine. We've got a bit of PTSD. Like I think, obviously, you would have been playing those two games, 2003, 2002. Yeah. Um, 2002, I think, was actually Mick McCarthy's was his last home game or maybe his last game in general uh, when he lost 2-1 to Switzerland. Uh, you were playing that night at centre-half, obviously. Like, uh, What are your memories from that Swiss team? Was it kind of a situation where they were the better team on those two occasions or were they two opportunities missed for Ireland? Well, certainly two opportunities missed. We went into the game expecting to win as we always had done in Dublin, but there was a, it was a surreal atmosphere, it really was, in terms of how consistent we'd been three or four years going into that. Then we had to go to the World Cup, have a decent World Cup, come back, beat um, what was considered a good Finland team in our first game of that new season, 3-0 away. Then we got to Russia and play dreadfully, give away dreadful goals. So we knew the pressure then was on Mick because of the scenario, because of the pop popularity contest with him and Roy Keane. It wasn't anything to do with the results as such. It was just the fact that Roy Keane and supporters were backing him. And I think we went there and I think we usually had a, a swagger about us going and playing at home to Dublin. With that confidence, we proved it over those two or three years that we could beat most teams there. But there was definitely a different sense there. We felt that there was a bit of hostility towards me. We were desperate to protect our manager because we um, obviously had so much faith in him. And I think it affected us. It really did, even though we were experienced players and we conceded a bad goal to begin with. Forced uh, an equaliser late on. I think I bundled the guy into to, for an own goal. And then give away a dreadful goal late on, and then everything just changed from that moment on. Yeah, there's there's photos of you celebrating that goal. Actually, I think yeah, you might have claimed the Gary. Yeah. Uh, and there's also photos of you <laughs> and uh, Jörg Steele, the um, the Swiss goalkeeper, going at it. I'm not sure is it that game or a different one. Oh, I don't know. No, I can't, no, I couldn't, I, no I couldn't tell you. I can't, I can't remember. I'm afraid. I'm sure I was going out. There was a few times I was going out with Shay. <laughs> <laughs> so you'd, you'd fight with all the goalkeepers, basically. There's so many of them that you can't oh. actually remember which game it was. You know these goalkeepers now, you can't barely touch them. They're, they're a protected species, aren't they? <laughs> oh, there he is. And he's got, um, we've got, that's a great picture. You're the captain that night, so um, where is it? That's in the away games in Jacob Park and Basel. Oh, yeah, Mick would have been gone by then. He's, uh, yeah. he's, he's, wearing, um, he's wearing a massive bandage. I don't know if you were responsible for that or not, but uh, so that's in October 2003. Yeah, so that would have been under Brian. Um, when, when you said, like, so that, that's the end for that era. Is the damage not really done in the, the Russia game where they kind of killed us and like it was always very hard to come back from that or did you feel like it was actually okay you're going to be able to come back from that? 
Oh, yeah, no, we had such confidence when we come back from that. Of course we did in terms of how we performed in games leading into that. The fact that we went to Portugal, Holland, we're so light and, and gave good account of ourselves. We had a real belief and that obviously that's topped up by the fact that we've um, just had a major champion, uh, major finals under our belts as such. So we had, we, had, we had immense confidence in winning that game, but there was just something different and... And it was a shame, really, because I've never questioned the Iron supporters. They've always they'll always back the shirt. But there was an element there that um, was taking Roy's side ahead of mix, and without going over old ground again. It, and it was just that was just the mood. And as a team, as a, as a team that that evening, we we let our manager down and we let ourselves down really. Because if had had we won that game, now listen, had we won that game against Switzerland, I don't think that kind of big story between. Roy not being in the Ireland team anymore would have died down. I don't believe that for one moment, but we would have been able just to bat it off for a little bit. Yeah, it's um, it was a crazy time and it kind of still hangs slightly over Irish football. Um, it comes up from time to time. Uh, it came up again <laughs> a little bit last night. Uh, let's talk a little bit about what you expect from the Swiss team. Now, you, you said that um, the Irish side that have qualified for seven out of the last eight tournaments. Yeah. It, it's, it's kind of weird that notwithstanding they've done that, they haven't really turned into a team who you would consider a quarter-final team or a team who are like trying to surge forward to make a semis. That they, you know, they don't have the talent pool of a Belgium, say, who are everybody's favourite dark horses. is now obviously going to be favourites for most tournaments when they go into because of the quality players they have. But they haven't kicked on as a football culture where we're actually scared of them tonight. Well, I think that might be a bit, little bit dismissive in terms of you, you think about and, and the comparison to the Belgian team yeah, is, is an obvious one. But don't forget, in the Nation Leagues, they, they've beat this Belgian golden generation 5-2. You know, this is a talented Swiss team and they probably are underperforming then when they get to the major finals. But they're, 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 a, they're a team who will look to dominate possession. It will go through Xhaka in the base of midfield and, and enable them to do that then. They can get players in around our, our, dif, our number four area. So whoever's playing deep midfield, it's, the suggestion is it would be Glenn Whelan. But we can't allow him to be isolated. And likewise, then when they're out of possession, they quickly become a really good defensive structure. Back five, the midfielders get back easy. So even trying to open them up will be difficult. But as I said, Mick said they've done their homework, which is refreshing to hear because I don't think that was the case of the previous regime in terms of where they can find gaps. And I think they'll deliver that on the training field. And so those players going out there tonight will know exactly how they can hurt this Swiss team, but it won't be easy. How, how do you stop Granit Xhaka? I mean, like we, we've seen at the very top level, he can be a little bit susceptible, be a little bit rash. Like he gave away the worst penalty of all time, I think, in the, the North London Derby at the weekend. Like, Don't it, mention that, though. He doesn't <laughs> like to mention the bad things, he said. <laughs> Remember how many chances he set up? But no, listen, he's a good player in terms of that. And I, I think he, he's, he, he's probably even better for the Swiss team. I, mm. I've always been... I've always argued I don't think he's an Arsenal um, central midfielder in terms of getting Arsenal back to the top. I've never felt that. Him coming in at the same time as Mustafi for a huge investment to take the pressure off of Wenger. He bought those players early on in the off-season. And so we build them up as being top players. I, I don't think he's good enough to that. I think he is a liability at times for Arsenal. But there's no doubt in his ability on the ball. And if we allow him to dictate play, he'll do just that. If he gets within striking range of our goal, he'll do that as well. So I think... I think he's the type of player that Mick probably will go after and say we had to hunt him down, stop him playing. And if we make it difficult for him and we're in his face, then we don't know how he's going to react. Yeah, because like, you look at the quotes that have popped up in the newspaper this morning, Mick talking about aggression and how aggression is a hallmark of some of the best teams of Liverpool, of Manchester City, especially without the ball. And it seems that under Mick McCarthy, we're more better placed to actually kind of hammer the hammer, so to speak, and actually go after someone like Granit Xhaka and actually press them quite a bit without the ball, when Ireland are without the ball. Well, listen, uh, even, it's, even in terms of how hit and miss it's been since Mick took over in terms of the players getting used to how he wants to play, what has been obvious is the fact that we squeeze the pitch. Our defence gets to the halfway line, which allows our midfielders to get close to players like Xhaka and allows midfielders to get in advanced areas and support our front players, which is, at times, they've been so isolated. So I, I expect us to play high up the pitch. I know that the likes of Duffy and that is not particularly comfortable doing it, but he's getting better at it. Richard Keogh will probably be vocal, making sure we do squeeze the pitch. And if you play centre-half for Mick McCarthy, you have to do it. And I think keeping with what we are seeing with the elite-level teams all over the world is that they're pressing high, they're trying to win and form turnovers high up the pitch so that when they do do that they're within striking distance and too often over the last couple of years whenever we've won the ball back it's been on our own 18 yard box and we've got um, two thirds of the pitch to try and get up and it's difficult 
Like when we went into this uh, campaign, Gary, there was an idea that we might strike up an absolutely world class or close to world class partnership on the right hand side with Matt Doherty and Seamus Coleman. Callum Robinson. Ah, that's about world class. We're, okay, You're stretching but, it a little bit there. Top class. Let's go with top class. Top uh, class. Yeah. <laughs> that, uh, that was top, stretching top, it a little top, to, to, to be top, fair. Right hand. Right um, Callum Robinson's going to play uh, on the right, uh, right inside today. Like that relationship between Seamus Coleman and Callum Robinson, quietly could become uh, a very top situation for Ireland, couldn't it? A productive one, yeah, no mm. doubt. In terms of you think of the way that Seamus is always looking to bomb on, I would expect that Callum Robinson from a wide right position will attack centre and try and get his goals. And I saw him playing against Chelsea, as I did all the other Sheffield United boys, and it's a great bonus for us that they're now playing in the Premier League. I expect them to turn up and play with their Irish shirts with real confidence now. And the very fact that he got his goal, he had a bad miss early on, and you, you were hoping that wouldn't affect him, but he done great, he really did. And he was not alone. Ender Stevens now on that left-hand side was so so good against Chelsea, just couldn't cope with him. So these players are now coming into this Irish squad with real confidence, similar with Horahan at Aston Villa. But then the flip side of that also is that the lads who are struggling a little bit at the moment, club football, Jeff Hendricks, Duffy who's been dropped, McLean who's struggling in, in a bottom of the table championship team, all that will go out the window because they'll be coming back into the Irish squad, desperate to do well. And I, I, I'm looking really forward to this game tonight. What do you think is going to happen? I think we'll get a positive result. I think it will be difficult, but it just it's, it's just on those moments. There's fine moments, and we have to be concentrated. Don't give anything away. And I think the Swiss, as we've heard in the build-up, they're not looking forward to this game. Um, the viewers here this morning will recognise that it's gone very dark there. Gary's... Uh, I was going to say, someone's turned the light off. Let me know. <laughs> is, it, is it Brexit related? Is that what's happened? <laughs> it's like... Bear with me. Bear with me. There you go. That's better. Try and get a bit of light on the situation. Oh, yeah, okay. It wasn't a storm. Go on, carry on. I actually yeah, did, carry on. I did think there was a storm, maybe, that, uh, that that's what had happened. <laughs> <laughs> no, nah, there you go. Sun shining now. That's better. Uh, look, you can see me now. Oh, no, that's not better now. People can actually see me. Uh, it's, it's perfect. Great. It's perfect. Uh, I always love that uh, piece of modern art you have behind you as well. It's, uh, it's yeah. like a perfect backdrop. You want, <laughs> where did you get it? Is, it, is it? is there a story behind it? Uh, no, it's just a local painter um, who, who made... Um, created it as such and it's just in, in this office so yeah, it's nice it, it was it summed up the mood of the i must have to change it now for some sky blue thinking and stuff now i think <laughs> but that was ireland under martin o'neill and uh yeah i felt that way yeah <laughs> <laughs> look i um the the fai situation at the moment from a financial perspective is obviously in, in dire straits there was a, a story yesterday about how much qualification would mean financially and like it would mean a lot to football people if the team could qualify while everything that's going on in the FAI is, is going on. Do players ever, does any of that ever seep through to them? I mean, certainly this group of players who would know the League of Ireland intimately might be a bit more tuned in. Yeah, listen, in terms of how many play, players have played League of Ireland now and have made the breakthrough to the national team, which is great, that's, that, we'd love to have that pathway and, and have more people do it. But in terms of their mindset, listen, these players are desperate to get to major finals for their own dreams to be fulfilled. Of course they have. They've grown up dreaming of playing for Ireland, but they are aware of just how important it is for the nation that we're there, of course, in terms of those summers are not the same. And, and certainly major championships, even the organisers will say it, they're not the same without the Irish supporters there. So that's the pressure you have. That's a responsibility you have. You have the honour of playing for Ireland, but you are aware of the responsibility and how important it is to the nation. Because if you weren't the one pulling on the shirt, you'd be the one just cheering the team on. Yeah. All right. Um, so you're feeling relatively confident about how tonight's going to go and how the rest of the group is going to go, having seen enough of the opposition at this stage? Um, I'm, I'm relatively confident in terms of the team will be as organised as possible. That, that's where I get my confidence from. I'm, I'm not suddenly thinking that this is a group of players who are going to be expansive and, and unbelievable and world-class, like Owen said. I don't <laughs> believe that. But I do think they're better than they've been... Um, than we've been told. I, I do think that collective is a better group than we were consistently told that they can't do this, can't do that. Mick will be under no illusions. He knows where, where their failings are, but it'll work to their positive. Um, in, in terms of uh, Robinson's future, we, we were talking about this in the show yesterday, and uh, there was a sense that perhaps he's actually going to end up being our out-and-out -out striker and that maybe there is still room for um, Matt Doherty to play a role on the right. Do you see that for him as somebody who actually we should be developing the the future around now and, and turning him into an out-and-out centre-forward, a number nine or a nine-and-a-half or whatever it is, so it's actually 
it's a it's a partnership up front with McGoldrick and that that might be better for us in terms of trying to get some goals into the team. Yeah, listen, I I, I wouldn't rule that out at all, and I think certainly at times at Stamford Bridge he was brilliant. Got on the half turn at ten, found space, they could have <coughs> coped with him, turn, got his strike off, put great deliveries in, and but then it was also at the, at the at the point of their attack, so he has that ability. But if you're asking me whether or not it's likely to see them playing two up front tonight, I can't see it, and it's not because I don't think there'll be a good partnership. It's because I don't think we've got a good enough two man central midfield to play two centre forwards, and, and to be perfectly honest. I don't think we've had that since the days of Roy, uh, Mark Kinsella, Matt Holland and Lee Carsley. I don't think we've had centre midfielders who can play in a two. So that's the reason why. And the very fact that they can do it at Sheffield United is because they have a three-man midfield and a five-man back line. So they can afford to do it. But I don't think we can. Is there anything in how Sheffield United play at the back that we should be looking at? It came up this week when... Um, when obviously Duffy's not in the team for the last game and they've invested yeah. a fair bit of money and look, maybe he get, gets back in that team in a couple of weeks and that's just one of those things, but maybe he doesn't. And yet at the same time, we have John Egan playing where he's playing and understanding that like sometimes, I don't know there's not much time for experimentation, uh, in, particularly in this group, particularly for then Mick's career uh, as Ireland manager second time around. But is there anything in that? Should we be looking at that and going, that looks, you, know, you know how that works, John Egan, you could actually bring that to us. We've got two good centre-backs, we might have three good centre-backs. Yeah, I think um, that was muted a lot, wasn't it? Uh, Martin O'Neill would sometimes do it because of the fact that then we could put our full-backs, our attacking full-backs in those high advanced areas. But I, I, I don't see Mick McCarthy doing it, going to a three. I know when he initially took over as manager in his first spell, he played three at the back. I, I remember playing at times there with Roy Keane, who, who was the centre of the three. And at a time when that was a common theme, we'd seen top German players doing it by Munich, Sammer, those type of guys. But I don't see Mick going down that route again. But I've been so impressed with John Egan and, and not only because the fact that he's in the Premier League now, but I've just seen the strength of character that he's had. He come back from a dreadful injury, rebuilds his career at Gillingham, gets in the league one team of the year there, gets his move to Brentford and keeps doing it. And he impresses all the time. So, And, he was, and he's impressed at Premier League level. Still got a lot to learn, of course. Who didn't when they first went at that level? But I don't see Mick forcing John Egan into a back three, no. Yeah, OK. Um, I, I know by this stage, Gary, it's kind of made news everywhere that uh, we had a pretty big road show last night with uh, our friends at Cadbury's. It was in the Borgosh Energy Theatre. So 2,200 people were there for Gary Neville and for Roy Keane. And I'm not sure they were there for Gary Neville. I'm not sure they were either. <laughs> well, I'd, I'd say Gary Neville would, would definitely pull a crowd. There was probably at least yeah. 60 people of the uh, <laughs> 2,200 who were like, oh, I really want to see what Gary Neville has to say about this. But um, yeah, and so look... You you obviously have spent a fair bit of time with Roy Keane at this stage, um, and he was everything that Roy Keane is. Um, John Duggan described it earlier on. You know, it was uh, it was charismatic, it was uh, charming, it was funny, and then it got hard, and then you were like quite uncomfortable for sections of it. Um, so I, I I don't know really what it was like um, being a teammate in in that environment because you know like really. Uh, a lightning wit at times and um, yeah. and then also obviously capable of moments of great anger what's the question what was that like being a teammate brilliant because he was an iconic player brilliant midfielder he really really was and he was the type of midfielder and I know like everyone knows like by watching him and stuff like that but what he did was was, was incredible even at that level, we're international players. I know he's above us in terms of a Manchester United player as such, but he elevates your game as a teammate. He was that good. He really was. And in terms of people thinking about a captain, it was no, there was no like war cry speeches as you were going out. It was just calm, relaxed. And as soon as the whistle went, then he came into his environment and he was brilliant. And in terms of knowing him for 10 or sorry, playing with him for 10 years, I don't particularly know him that well. I really enjoyed his company. As you just said, funny guy at times really was rapier wit and just a, a, um, a great pleasure to play alongside him. And, and for someone like me, who's relative, I know he's not that much older than me, but he, he, when I came into the squad, I was still relatively young. You want to learn off of him. You want to learn off the Manchester United captain. What do they do at United? And he was very, very um, um, helpful in terms of how they were trained and you're learning about things like that. So I thoroughly enjoyed it. Now, listen, of course, there's an edge to Roy, but that, that's why he is box office. That's why you guys want him on these type of shows because he's a headline act, simple as that. Yeah. Um, the full road show is coming tonight with um, the two lads at our Carrie Road Show. But here's a snippet of Roy Keane talking about where his relationship is at with Alex Ferguson. Have a look. When did you last speak to Ferguson? 
not since then, obviously. Not one conversation? I think when he apologizes to me, I probably will say hello to him, yeah. No, <laughs> no interest in speaking to the man. Nothing even over the past year, the ill health made you think, maybe I'll just give him a call, maybe life's too short. No. <laughs> when he apologizes to me, and David Gill. No problem. Have we got another? Have we got another section? Yeah, they they did have another section. Don't worry, because it goes to an outbreak after that, Gary. But um, yeah, it's a bit mad, isn't it, that uh, this partnership, which was at the heart of Manchester United's first proper great era um, under Ferguson, where they do eventually land the Champions League, that they can't make peace, no matter what happens at this stage. Yeah, listen, in terms of the romantic view of it, you hope that everyone was great friends. But listen, at that level, you know, they're, they're both serial winners. You know, Ferguson has discarded so many iconic players at United. You know, he just gets rid of them, as simple as that. That's that ruthless nature. And that's something that you're probably looking at that the current Manchester United manager and saying, do you have that presence? You know, it's all well and good in terms of what Ferguson's done in terms of cultivating these players, recruiting the best players to make that Manchester United team as strong as possible. But people dismiss how ruthless he is in terms of discarding those successful players to bring those players through. And that's something you look at Solskjaer now. Does he have that presence? I'm not convinced. But certainly you, you, you're hearing about Roy. I'm not surprised. I'm not surprised that Roy's not particularly... Um, best friends with him as such. It's, it was no, um, it was no um, shock to hear that. Yeah, it struck me earlier when we were playing that clip that um, Ferguson and Keane are, are very, very similar characters, and that like ultimately expecting either of them to back down is probably a bit ridiculous. Right, listen, it's, I don't think it's it's probably ever going to happen. Everyone's both of them's probably going to think that they're this, they're, they're the, the one who's been wronged or they're the one who's right, and you know this, this, that's just why it's going to play out. Yeah, Gary, good stuff. Enjoy the game tonight. Thanks a million for joining us. Yeah, looking forward to it. Thanks, guys. Good luck. That's Gary Breen giving us some thoughts on uh, the game tonight. He's very upbeat about it. Upbeat about how we're doing at the moment. How yeah. do you feel? Yeah, pretty good as well after listening to that, to be honest. Kind of hammer some of a few ideas. I think you look at the Denmark collapse that they endured and the calamities that occurred in their own box and how Ireland can actually create a little bit of consternation in opposition boxes. Uh, that's Mc one. McGoldrick is the right man to do that, isn't he? He is the right man to do that. From set pieces as well, we're always a threat. Hey, I can't believe I've just said that, even though it's the biggest cliche around uh, Irish football. That exists, but it exists because it's true. And, uh, like, I, I don't know, I, th I think I think life is a bit more upbeat as an Irish football fan, uh, it, like, independent of everything else that's happening. Yeah, in the I, like, well. I mean, just, just <laughs> on the pitch. Okay. Just on the pitch. Okay. Uh, that under twenty one, under twenty team is good. Yeah, exactly, and uh, the, that's the team to get behind, right? It's it hasn't on the pitch, on the pitch only. It hasn't been a bad twenty nineteen. Yeah, speaking of which, um, last night Stephen Kenny did tell us that he was happy with the hype around his under twenty one team. Have a look. 